as, yeah. um, okay, I'll just get started here. So I wanted to start zooming out back to some of these, uh, um, you know, Redshift six plus observations. Um, and of course, I have to show this slide that, because this was the first slide that I would show in, in many, many talks uh, through, through grad school and, and, and afterwards, um, you know, motivating a lot of, a lot of the work we're, we're doing locally. Um, and this is these, these early detections of carbon-4 in these, these uh, Redshift 6 lens systems. Um, and the uh, you know, at equivalent widths that were just unprecedented, like 20 to 40 angstroms uh, equivalent width. Um, and of course now, it's great to show because the comparison to what we can do now with JWST is just um, completely <laughs> ridiculous. Um, and the same, this is one of the same objects that I just showed now with um, a stack near spec spectrum from, uh, from Michael Hopping's paper um, earlier this year. And uh, the, the, the full spectrum, FEB spectrum of this thing is, is just incredible. Confirms that this has 30 uh, something angstrom carbon four emission. Um, and also alongside it, this nitrogen four emission. Um, and this, this seems to be a pattern uh, emerging at these, these highest redshifts. Um, of course, Dan touched on this uh, on, on uh, yesterday. And uh, so a number of these systems now, a grow, growing sample, um, both at the very high luminosity end and uh, in, in lower mass lens systems and others, um, are emerging showing both you know, highly ionized gas emission and uh, nitrogen, um, far more nitrogen uh, than you can uh, um, uh, get without, yeah, you basically need to explain this with, with actual enrichment. Um, so we're looking at highly ionized nitrogen enriched gas in these systems. So why is this interesting? Um, and I know, just to take a step back, these, these enrichment patterns um, are very similar in, uh, to those that we see in, in some of the oldest uh, galactic structures of so globular clusters, the second population in, in these, uh, potentially also the oldest, most ancient component of the Milky Way, um, as we uh, heard about from Andre yesterday, um, and uh, seen almost nowhere else. It's very rare to see this, uh, you know, up until uh, just last year, we saw this in basically no uh, star-forming galaxies at, at any redshift. Um, and, and again, there's places that we do see it, these are almost exclusively uh, systems that are you know, extremely dense cluster environments, so stars that we think formed in, in some of the densest clusters, um, potentially also where we expect to, to see black holes most efficiently. Um, and, and critically also, this is of hotly debated origins. We've known about this in the globular clusters for a very long time. Um, it's in pretty much every globular cluster that you look at, uh, and there are many uh, candidate enrichment sources here um, but this has not been resolved by any means, uh, I think, uh, safe to say from the globular cluster abundances alone. Like, what is actually producing this? Um, one thing that I think is fairly uncontroversial, though, is that if you want to get the sort of enrichment pattern in an overabundance of nitrogen relative to oxygen and carbon, um, it's very hard to do this without massive stars. Um, so massive stars are, are one of the best places, perhaps the, the, the primary place that we're producing nitrogen. And this happens via uh, the CNO cycle, hot hydrogen burning, where we uh, convert carbon and oxygen into nitrogen very, very quickly. Um, and this means that all massive star interiors that are hot enough, so all massive stars that are hot enough to burn via the CNO cycle, um, which is all massive stars, um, have a bunch of nitrogen enriched material from the onset of hydrogen burning locked up in their, in their cores. Um, the difficulty is just getting it out. Um, and so, again, uh, going, coming back to this, this, uh, this, this debate, this is a long-standing question, what is actually power, or what is producing this enrichment in globular clusters? Um, and now we can ask what is producing this enrichment that we're seeing in these um, fairly massive systems, or you know, massive, seemingly very luminous systems at, at Redshift uh, 6 plus. Um, one of the classic explanations is intermediate mass AGB stars, right? So this is where we think uh, from uh, looking at the, the buildup of nitrogen in most of the Milky Way and in these H2 regions, this is where we think most of this nitrogen is coming from, is from these, these evolved intermediate mass stars um, that are able to, to get this out via their, their slow winds. Um, so to get this, this ejecta from these AGV stars, um, perhaps it, uh, you know, this takes a much longer time, right? This is a 100 mega year time scale. Uh, wait for those AGV stars to evolve, those lower mass stars to evolve, um, eject that material, and then condense it. Um, that's one option. Uh, another very exciting option that, that a lot of folks are very, uh, 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 you know, that, that a lot of folks are very excited about, are that this could be a sign of supermassive stars. So in these dense cluster environments, um, it's very possible to, uh, through runaway collisions, potentially also through just 
uh, runaway accretion in the very early stages of these, of these uh, clusters, as we heard from Mike earlier, to form a, a very massive thousand solar mass stars at, at these cores. And if you do form one of these, uh, it's very easy. This thing is going to be burning via, and fully mixed, burning uh, via the CNO cycle, um, and, and immediately super Eddington, very easily ejecting this material into the ISM. Um, so if you do form these, this is, this is a very easy way to get this material out. Uh, problem is that we have not seen evidence of these yet. Um, I think is uncontroversial to say, but uh, or direct evidence of, of, uh, of these, these, uh, these stars. Um, and another option, and, and uh, you know, a whole class of option here is right that there are many other processes that could get this material out of massive stars at, at more prosaic masses as well. Um, so the excitement of seeing these 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 uh, uh, enrichment patterns in these in the ionized gas phase is that we can actually uh, potentially study whatever process is producing this enrichment in situ, um, which uh, I think it was very unexpected that we'd have this opportunity in the first place. Um, and uh, you know, as we as we've heard, there's a lot of debate about what's actually producing this in these in, the, in these uh, redshift six objects. We have very limited observations so far of the systems with which to work, and so it's very easy to to produce a lot of different models that, that will come together to produce uh, the spectrum that we that we see uh, in those right now. Um, and so naturally, you want to try to go to lower redshift. Um, and we heard it from uh, Massimo yesterday uh, uh, in the fantastic lightning talk. Um, the, uh, the model that they put together for a much easier to study system, uh, the Lyman continuum leaking cluster uh, lensed in, in, the, in the sunburst arc. Um, and this object is lensed down to parsec scales. It is clearly gravitationally bound. This is stuff that is very hard to do. <laughs> it's much impossible at redshift 10, um, except in the most you know, extreme lensing uh, situations. Um, and uh, uh, and there can actually put together this, this uh, uh, much more complete physical picture of what that gas that we're seeing in nitrogen three uh, is locked up in. Um, and again, uh, uh, put together, putting together a, a picture here that this, this is a massive star ejecta. And there we can actually also see directly those massive star winds in that, in that continuum um, that uh, uh, we don't yet see in these, these high redshift systems. Um, so what about really nearby? Um, and so this is the question that we asked about carbon four uh, um, uh, quite a while ago, uh, and that we've been continuing to ask, because uh, so it turns out if you look for carbon-4 emissions, so finding something like these 20 to 40 angstrom systems uh, in the very nearby universe, um, previously very uh, relatively, uh, uh, you know, essentially no objects that were dominated by star formation were known that had carbon-4 emission that was detectable at all. It's typically seen in carbon in P. cygni from these stellar winds. Um, but if you go to low enough metallicity in the very young ages, it turns out these, these, uh, uh, this carbon-4 emission is ubiquitous. You see it in everything below 10% solar um, that has a high enough h beta equivalent width, so it's dominated by a young enough solar population. But this carbon-4 above 10 angstroms um, uh, was, uh, was elusive. Um, and so a question arises is maybe we're just not looking at the very youngest systems that we would need to, to, to find this, uh, this emission. Um, so most HST samples uh, are, are relatively biased towards high metallicity. They're also, it turns out, somewhat surprisingly, biased away from uh, the youngest ages at these very low metallicities. Um, and this is, this is uh, uh, um, mostly an accident of these very youngest age systems are just rare. Um, and so uh, I want to highlight one of these objects here. Um, so we, we have systems, uh, you know, we had systems uh, many years ago um, at very, very low metallicity, so 12 plus log of H is 7.2, something like below 5% solar. Um, and, and the classic example here uh, that I've highlighted is, is 1 Zwicky 18. Um, but, uh, and I, I love 1 Zwicky 18, uh, this is one of my favorite galaxies, partially because it's so close you can just make these incredible, uh, you know, HST images of it and, and you know, almost start to resolve out individual clusters in, in, uh, in this, uh, this, this complex here. Um, and, uh, uh, but you can also just put the, the cost aperture down. Of course, it would be great to have the IFU to put down here in the, in the UV, but, you know, we've just got a, a, big, uh, a big aperture here. We, we plot that down here, um, and it turns out the spectrum of this thing is, is very clearly actively forming stars. We can see the clusters. Um, some of them are, 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 I think there's, there's, there's good evidence to suggest that these are, these are, some of these clusters are quite young. But the integrated spectrum of this object um, doesn't actually show a huge amount of UV emission. We do detect carbon-4 and helium-2, but at very low equivalent width, something like a few angstroms. 
Um, what's interesting is that uh, one ZPK-18 does, though, have a very blue UV slope. Um, and so I was actually just looking at this uh, uh, yesterday uh, with, with uh, Kevin, um, uh, so excited by, by uh, his talk on, on Monday, um, looking at these systems at, at uh, redshift, the highest redshifts, right, that have these extremely blue UV slopes, uh, but very little uh, detect, or very little slash no detected emission lines. Um, and one ZPK-18 actually has like a beta slope of minus 2.8. Um, it would be impossible to detect this carbon-4 at these, uh, uh, you know, at, at uh, uh, GDBST sort of signal noise limits. Um, it has some O2. You know, it, has, it does have optical emission, of course, at, at fairly high equivalent width, but, but the blue, the, it has a blue relatively featureless spectrum, and if you line it up versus some of these, uh, uh, these redshift, you know, 10, 10 plus things, you know, it, it's, you know it's, it, we're missing a lot of this, but there's not a huge amount of emission lines here. Maybe 37, 27 doesn't quite line up. We don't know. We don't have coverage for this object. And I'm not saying this is at all a unique solution, um, but it is certainly possible to have a fairly blue UV slope, fairly weak UV nebular emission, um, uh, and, and uh, uh, you know, and the closest example of these systems uh, shows this. Um, but uh, so we know about younger systems at these metallicities, um, and we know about much younger systems. So H, so one zk 18 is sitting at something like uh, uh, 80 angstroms in H beta equivalent width, which is a lot relative to the normal, the full galaxy population. But compared to these systems we're seeing at high redshift, very little. Um, and so this is uh, work that uh, Lauren Henson, um, who is a, uh, a Cassie student with us at Carnegie. Uh, uh, the summer before, or yeah, last summer, um, now is going to be joining UC Riverside as a graduate student. Um, they've been leading uh, uh, the, the cost spectra of the first three of these systems that we've been able to target at H beta equivalent widths more than double that of one's VK18. Um, and uh, again, so this is, this is a, a composite they've put together of all of the carbon-4 detections uh, in these, these cost samples as a function of metallicity and carbon-4 equivalent width prior to these, these new data. Um, and you can see that the max is around 10 angstroms. This is a log scale, so this, this it looks much more dramatic if you uh, if you put it in linear. But you can see a lot of the structure here at at, uh, at higher uh, uh, metallicity. And this is where these new systems sit. Um, so it turns out that all three of these systems we targeted power carbon four um, in excess of four angstroms. Um, and now, in conjunction also with this this target from uh, Yuri Isotov's paper uh, this year. Um, now we've discovered for the first time, you know, finally, we found this population of local systems, two now, <laughs> that power carbon-4 uh, in excess of, of 20 angstroms. And there, there are 30 to 40 angstroms. The uh, uh, Isotov source is actually, like, slightly above um, uh, uh, the, this, the, the, the most prominent of these, these redshift-6 uh, objects uh, in carbon-4. And so what do these systems look like? Um, they're uniformly extremely metal poor, dominated by ionizing radiation from very young stellar populations. Again, we're looking at extremely high H-beta equivalent widths. They both have extreme gas conditions, like O32 in excess of 50 for both of these, which is also uh, uh, looks something like these, uh, this uh, RxCJ uh, lens object. But interestingly, um, oh yeah, and, and also in, right, worth pointing out, if you plot them on an excitation diagram, uh, like uh, Michaela was, was uh, showing us yesterday, this is one of the, the classic boring ones, not an equivalent width one. But if you plot the next to um, uh, RxCJ and, and uh, A1703, they, they lie really right, almost right on top of those, those points there. Um, and, and, or in the most strongest does, at least. Um, and uh, uh, you know, solidly in the, the star forming region of this diagram. Uh, but interestingly, they have weak nitrogen lines. So we actually do detect nitrogen-4 in, uh, in both. Um, uh, in the uh, uh, Ejitov source, the spectrum is too very low resolution to really do a, a, a deconvolution of the two components. Um, but in, uh, uh, in our G160M spectrum, apologies, it's a little hard to see, it's very hard to see here, but we do actually detect both components. Uh, the signal noise is not super high, and so it's very hard to place a strong constraint on, on the uh, uh, electron density. But you can say that fairly confidently that it's consistent with 10 to the 5, but not higher. Um, and uh, certainly could be, could be lower. Um, but, uh, but again, we're, uh, uh, the strength of this is to first order consistent with, with normal nitrogen abundance. Um, so interesting. We're finding systems that have similar gas conditions, uh, similar ionization state, uh, but not this enhancement in nitrogen. Um, and so, you know, the question is open, I think, as to what exactly is missing here. 
Um, and certainly one possibility uh, is that we're just missing these, these high cluster densities. We don't have good imaging for these targets. Um, in SCSS, you saw these, these things are, are just uh, extremely you know, unresolved little blobs um, and uh, uh, you know, very hard to get down to parsec scales here. Um, uh, so very possible and, and yeah. Uh, um, right, and yeah, so I'm, I guess I have, so I have three minutes left, two minutes, one minute. About a minute and a half. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I'll just I'll just quickly say uh, um, what do I want to say here? <laughs> uh, yeah. So right. The question is, you know, how do you get this nuclear processed ISM uh, or material into the ISM to form new stars? Um, one possibility is is stellar winds. Um, you know, of course, most most stars in our galaxy that are massive enough to or that that are that are above ten solar masses, they're blowing themselves apart. Um, via radiatively driven winds. Um, this is this is a classic example of a Wolf Ray nebula um, around around one of these that I that I love to show. Um, and uh, the very massive stars. So we we know about these. They're, they're stars above 100 solar masses rather than a thousand. Um, these are uh, you know, we 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 know about a number of these that we can pick apart in like the core of R136, the core of 30 Deuteronomy. Um They're uh, 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 you know, very promising sources of this nitrogen-rich material. Uh, we see their nitrogen-rich winds. Um, and they're also, it's worth pointing out, uh, as a result of these winds, very visible in the integrated light of, of these systems. Um, but again, these, these winds, they should be weak at low metallicity. And I just want to motivate that that's the statement that we have not tested before uh, just this year. And so we're just now testing, as we heard about in, in Grace's talk, um, whether these, what these winds actually look like below the metallicity of the SMC. Um, uh, and as, as Grace has very nicely showed, in these O stars, they, uh, they appear to be even weaker than expected and interestingly slower. Um, and this is, you know, not to be glossed over, like we, I don't think we, I think it's safe to say we don't totally understand how radiative wind driving is working in these systems, um, even for normal O stars at these metallicities. Um, and I just want to quickly, quickly point out that, that, uh, there, you know, there's, there's, uh, uh, in these, in these dwarf regulars, there's, uh, uh, you know, for the most part, these are looking like normal O stars at relatively low mass, but we're seeing indications across, across these systems of, of some binary interaction, potentially, um, of weirdness. Um, and, and a particularly striking example is we found this, this system that is, uh, emission line dominated in the optical, emission line dominated in the UV. And uh, I think we, you know, we're, we're confident now this looks like a, a strip star candidate at extremely low metallicity, driving in a, for this metallicity quite strong wind. Um, you can see the iron lines uh, on the left-hand side here. We actually have iron constraints, um, and you're seeing a, a wind that's, that's like an order of magnitude higher than expected, um, much slower, strongly nitrogen enriched. Um, there's weird stuff going on at low metallicity, and how exactly this connects to all of these uh, and enrichment mechanisms is not clear, but it's, you know these are all ways to get nitrogen enrichment out, or sorry, nitrogen enriched material out, um, you know, all the way down. And uh, so I'll, just, I'll leave my summary slides here in the uh, break for discussion. Thanks. Questions. Thanks, Peter. Sorry, it went just a little fast at the end. Can you yeah, yeah. just back up to discuss the role of binarity in producing the high N over O? And was that the was the idea just that if you have these high densities, you're likely to have more interactions, and so more of these strip stars, or was there something else going on with the binary specifically? Yeah, yeah. I should have I should have just like skipped past this entirely. No, no, this is super interesting. About so it, I'm and then glad I can you come back to show it. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But no, so um, so yeah, a very good question. Um, and indeed, this was far too much to try to <laughs> throw in here. But um, uh, uh, right. So there's the there's a first order question you can ask of just like um, uh, if you just look. So binary interaction is very messy. We see examples of it in in the Milky Way that you can actually see in in uh, in detail, and you can actually resolve the material getting thrown off. Um, uh, these binaries uh, into the into the ISM at fairly low velocity. Um, it's very hard to retain most of that for it to be fully conservative. Um, and so, if you have interaction uh, happening at all for for a, um, a binary system, a lot of that that envelope of the donor is going to get thrown off into the ISM. And if you carve all the way down to the core, 
you carve into this uh, this uh, um, material that's seen hydrogen burning, or so that's that's a, that's a dynamical that. channel for getting material out rather than a wind. Is that is that the idea? No. Yes, and exactly, and it's and it's it's one that is conveniently also very uh, easily enhanced by by dynamics. So like if you have a population of binaries that are in a very dense cluster, three body interactions are going to like harden all of your binaries and make it much more likely that they're going to interact and go through this this process because not all. You know, depending on the, the initial binary population, not all of these are actually going to, to fully strip. We think many of them are, but like, um, yeah, if you harden all your binaries in a, in a uh, dense cluster, you get a ton more of, of this going on. And it's very, and yeah, this material is, is uh, almost certainly ending up out there in the ISM, much lower velocity than in the winds, although it also is producing things that are driving <laughs> those winds off the, the cores still. Um, yeah, and, and this is, this is, uh, um, uh, a, a, a plot of, you know, kind of like a phenomenological model of, of what if you just say, what if you take all those envelopes that you expect to strip just under more, like very conservative assumptions about uh, binary evolution, and then look at those enrichment patterns and see, does it look like what you see in globulars and to first order um, so to make sure that it's, it's, you know, it lines up um, fairly nicely. Again, to first order. Um, and yeah, if you, you know, why would you see it just in these dense clusters? Maybe you have to enhance this, maybe you, to really get enough of this material, uh, or most, enough of these systems interacting. Thank you. Um, it's technically time for, for coffee now, so let's see. Show of hands, do you, do you want to hear two more questions? I see hands up. Okay, let's go for two more questions, Joe. Uh, yeah, great talk. Can you go back to your, how, just walk through the physics of the basic physics of how you get the density constraint for the high uh, equivalent with carbon four emitters. Oh yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Very good question. Yeah. So the um, uh, the densities that we're talking about when we're talking about these these ten to the five, ten to the six uh, uh, for these these nitrogen emitters, um, that's generally coming from either carbon three or nitrogen uh, four here, and those are actually like uh, 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 linked uh, 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 transitions. Um, like the same transition just in, in the in the two uh, uh, ions, um, and uh, uh, one is semi-forbidden, one is forbidden. So at high densities, um, the 1483 component for nitrogen four uh, is totally suppressed, and so you can just from that ratio uh, compare to like a nebular. Uh, Got it. Uh, it's a simple nebular. Just the basic like. densitometer from ISM. Yes. Yeah. 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 Thanks. Yeah. And it's 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 important to note also the critical density for that is. Is uh, very high, so like the sensitivity yeah. range is is ten to the four to ten to the seven or so. Yeah, I ask because um, that, that's approaching the critical density. Of, I mean, ten to the six is approaching the critical density of O3, right? So like at some point you stop seeing O3, and that's that's one of the arguments that people have made for these little red dots being AGN is that is that the O3 is not broad, right? So right. I guess I'm just wondering if if. I was surprised at how high these densities are. Is why I asked. Yeah, yeah, and I think I think it's for this object, for instance, it's very hard to say that it's a ten to the five. It could totally be a ten to the three, ten to the four. It's the, the uncertainty on the ratio is is uh, is sufficiently uh, high. Um, so yeah, just to be clear, I'm not saying that it's that this is has it's consistent with ten to the five, but it's not a constraint really. <laughs> Okay, one last question from Rafi. Yeah, very rapidly. Um, so if you go back to the slide where you were showing the um, chemical imprints of dynamical interactions at, at the very end. Yeah, yeah, So yeah. Um, um, my, I guess that my question is on the time scales that you need to have this uh, uh, nitrogen enhancement by, by this mechanism. Because if I understand correctly, uh, most of the uh, enrichment comes from relatively low mass stars. Uh, so, uh, is this, you know, comparable with what we are looking at at very high redshift, where you know, time scales are much shorter, apparently? Yeah, yeah, very good question. So, yeah, the time scales for this are um, highly dependent on on uh, what your binary looks like. So, for the classic picture is that these things go through case B mass transfer, which is when the, the more massive component crosses the Hertzsprung gap, which maybe it doesn't happen at low metallicity as often, you know, we don't really know. You know it's extremely uncertain, but you can have it happen during, during hydrogen burning too if you get your stars close enough together. Um, so the time scales can be the hydrogen burning lifetime or, or less for the most massive stars if you harden everything and, and like, um, force those interactions to happen. 
Um, but yeah, we really, <laughs> we really don't know. And most of the modeling has been focused on lower mass objects, partially because, yeah, we don't know. They're, they're, we're a little, little bit more confident about how those are going to behave post-main sequence. Um, but it's, it's entirely possible to have these effects at, at bigger time scales. Be back from coffee a few minutes before four o'clock, and our first speaker then will be Jenna Samuel, given the schedule change. Let's thank Peter again.